Welcome to the Civil War Digital Digest. I'm your host, Felicia, and today I'm here with Mike Wagner again, and this time Felicia. we're going to talk about India rubber. Um, so in the previous kind of overview of rubber, we kind of talked about how Goodyear patents vulcanization. Right. So then what does he do? Well, after vulcanization comes implementing products, which was his big thing. He spent the rest of his life pretty much developing new applications for rubber and India rubber, but immediately he needed to make some money to pay back his debt. So he issued licenses to various manufacturers, primarily for boots and shoes, but okay. there were some other things they were making also at that time, but boots and shoes were the, were the big things. And as things developed and, and the products got a little bit better, we started to see some military applications and additional civilian applications. I think Goodyear's big promotion came at the uh, World's Fair of its time, which was the Great Exhibition okay. in London, 1851, at the Crystal Palace. So what was that? It was a huge event where companies and manufacturers from all over the world displayed their products in very okay. prominent ways in very prominent buildings. And uh, Goodyear's display consisted of three rooms completely made of rubber and hard rubber. The walls, the rugs, the draperies, the furniture, the musical instruments, balloons floating around in the air. and So like uh, an India rubber world. It was, yeah, and as a matter of fact, that's what Goodyear envisioned. He was okay. really thought anything in the world could be made out of India rubber. Okay. By the way, at the Great Exhibition, he was one of only three Americans to win uh, the top prize that okay. they gave away. And similarly, in 1855, uh, he, um, at a similar display and also was one of the Americans that won top awards there. So uh, Wow, so he's like kind of changing the world and really shaking things up with this whole rubber idea. That was his obsession. His obsession was that, that every he thought rubber could be used for anything and uh, in 1853 and 1857 in two parts he published uh, Gum Elastic and its varieties, another name for rubber, yeah. Gum Elastic. Uh, and he listed in there like detailed hundreds of items in all different fields, any field you can think of, uh, hundreds of items that could be made out of rubber and hard rubber. A couple years after that, in 1857, by the way, the, the Englishman Thomas Hancock did his personal narrative, which was a similar okay. uh, book to Goodyear's. And the very cool thing about both of these and all the applications that they listed, yeah. in 1939, when they did a reprint of both of those books combined, the, the authors mentioned in the foreword that up to that point in time, there hadn't been one use of rubber that hadn't been detailed by either Hancock or Goodyear back in, 18, in the 1850s. Really? So they're like really yeah. ahead of their time in Pretty thinking much of, ahead of their all time. of these yeah. things. Yeah. Well, Mike, we have all these interesting objects in front of us and they're all India rubbers. Mm -hmm. What is India rubber? Well, India rubber is basically rubber, okay? okay. <laughs> basically latex taken from uh, any number of trees, but principally the heavier tree in, in, in South America, vulcanized through the process of uh, heat and sulfur. Uh, made into a usable material, flexible and pliable in, in literally any condition, and can be m utilized in many different forms, and basically even adding some more sulfur to it, we can make hard rubber out of it. So, okay. uh, so how, are how are they making the shoe? Is it a rubber cloth that's manufactured and then turned into a shoe from the cloth? Yeah, most of the time w when we see any of these rubber products, it's not just uh, rubber, it's a fabric of some kind with th that's coated with the rubber that's been combined with sulfur and metallic compounds that is pressed then and subjected to heat okay. and then uh, uh, formed into the, different, uh, into the different products that we see. Okay, so let's kind of backtrack and, you know, you said some of the first applications were clothing and shoes. Mm -hmm. So we have some examples of those. Sure. Do you want to kind of tell us a little bit about yeah. them and what's going okay. on? Yeah, yeah, this is a, a rubber overshoe that uh, has a Goodyear patent extension date of 1858 on it. Uh, the patent was issued in 1844. Okay. It was extended in 1858 to 1865, so okay. that's the way it worked, and it had to be marked with a patent. Still in remarkable good shape, as wow, you can see. Wow, that's really flexible. It is, yeah. especially since it was in the ground for over 100 years. Yeah. So, uh, this is a pair of Civil War era child's shoes, or over, over shoes, and they have the Civil War patent dates on them. And interestingly, it's a Boston Rubber Shoe Company, which okay. comes later on when we talk about the Civil War. They were one of the subcontract manufacturers of rubber blankets for the okay. Union Army. Oh, so, wow. So, yeah. really, they're just doing everything with they, this. They are. You can see we have different types of coats and capes, different types of, uh, that's price lists, 
This advertisement from 1856 details a number of different coats and boats, portable boats, Is horse, that a horse suit? It's a diving suit, yes. They, a rubber diving suit with a air pumps attached to it, as you can see. Tents and leggings and um, fishing trousers. Wow. Um, we see a, a horse blanket on here, and so we see over here, this is a patent model of a, of a rubber horse blanket. Okay, so that's the whole thing, it's just a smaller version. It's a smaller version. Okay. The patent office required, up until around 1900, they required that a working model be submitted with the okay. patent, okay? So this horse, there had been horse blankets patented before. This is an improved horse blanket that added vents on the top to, so the horse wouldn't sweat. Okay, it's, because it doesn't breathe really well because it, of the rubber. Rubber does not breathe, breathe very well at all. No. Okay. No. So uh, what, what do we have here? Uh, this is an early version of a life preserver. This is a belt type life preserver. Okay. Each of these are individual rubber chambers, but they were all inflated by this single uh, brass valve that's on it. So uh, Goodyear actually invented or implemented several types of life preservers, even okay. things like traveling valises and musket covers that could be sealed up and converted into a inflatable life preserver. Really? So, yeah. Yep. So, it, so it'll hold air then? Absolutely. That was one cool thing about rubber. So as a result of that, you had a lot of things rolling out like air mattresses okay. of the time, uh, cushions, uh, things like that, and also But they're not like air mattresses Oh, today. no, no. Oh, my God. It's not like a blow-up Walmart green one. No, okay. No. <laughs> Typically, it would be something with a valve like this and, and very, by today's standards, maybe a little bit crude because it's black. It's rubber. Yeah. Um, and waterbeds, by the way, they introduced, oh. uh, even in the early 1830s, they were talking about them, but Goodyear and Hancock both pictured in their books uh, waterbeds. So besides kind of things that hold air, <coughs> hold water, and clothing, what else are they doing with this? Well, you see a few applications here, by the way. Rubber balls, very early application, both hollow and solid rubber balls. Okay. This has the Goodyear patent date on it, um, so legally manufactured, so to speak. We have an advertisement here, or not an advertisement, a receipt for half a dozen India rubber footballs, which at the time would have been more like a soccer ball today, okay. a round, kickable ball. Um, we had things in the industrial world. We had uh, different types like railway springs, uh, ambulance springs, okay. things like that made out of rubber. Also like tubing and um, packing, uh, washers, things like that on the industrial side. So and things that you'd think of today kind of as f that are flexible rubber things today they were doing back then. Absolutely with back then. Rubber. As well as anything waterproof. Keep in mind okay. anything like uh, rain hats and jackets and, and, and overcoats made out of rubber. Some of them very fancy. Some of them lined um, okay. actually with uh, uh, alpaca and things like that. So we oh, were wow. doing some pretty fancy stuff. Yeah. So we've kind of touched on kind of the clothing application and things right. like that and the patents. Um, so tell me, what am I looking at here? Oh, wow. That, okay, that's that's an inkwell, believe it or not. It doesn't look much like an inkwell, no. but it's, <laughs> it's rubber. It was softer at one point in time. There's two patent markings on it. One is uh, Burnett's patent for the inkwell design itself, okay. and the other is Goodyear's rubber patent to protect both patents. So if you look at the patent drawing, uh, you'll see that that rubber part of the well is, is, is mounted inside a metallic, fancy metallic frame. Okay? okay. That frame includes underneath, a lever underneath, which as the ink started to go down in the ink well, you could ratchet that lever and it would push the rubber, soft rubber up from the bottom and keep pushing the ink up to the top. So you're oh, wow. always tipping your pen into a in, into into easy ink rather than trying to dip down inside. And you kind of fish around for right. the ink. Right. Okay. Right. So that inkwell is really kind of innovative in solving a bit of a problem. Yes. Have you seen any other innovative things that people are doing with rubber? I think there's a lot of them. And uh, e even just in the household uh, area, we talk about now we're, we're using rubber to, to seal preserve jars, oh. rubber seals uh, of different, uh, several different types of okay. them. Uh, we, we see applications for squealgies, the, uh, uh, which was applied in the Navy, kind of a rubber um, scrubber or okay. rubber for first. We have the introduction of the rubber ring, uh, ringer clothes washer, which newspaper advertisements uh, promoted as just saving the housewife much, much trouble and turmoil, okay, huh. with using the rubber ringers. Um, kind of on the fun side is, uh, is that uh, image that we see there, and it's a period tin type type image, but okay. instead of being printed on tin or paper, 
it's printed on rubber cloth, actually. Really? It's a piece of a thin rubber cloth, yeah. Oh, wow. Now, it does look like it's kind of faded. Yeah. I'm I think over a period of time, I've had that for about 25 years, and it's been, I've stored it carefully in the dark, but I think over time, um, possibly just uh, the image itself, but maybe the chemicals in the rubber, the sulfur and all, probably has an impact on that as well. Yeah. Okay. Because well, as you recall, rubber does can deteriorate over time too. It's very difficult to yeah. um, to find the proper conditions to store it. So kind of like, unlike the hard rubber, um, this rubber is a little bit more prone to kind of time and it wear. Is, it is indeed. It's, uh, its enemies are, uh, are the air itself, ozone, sunlight, uh, heat, changes of temperature from heat to um, hot to cold okay. can all impact the life of rubber and how it's stored. Yeah. Well, you've shown us kind of a lot of really awesome things and um, things that have kind of changed the world almost in terms of innovation and um, inventiveness yes. of Goodyear. And I think a lot of it is Those he patented, too. Right? Yeah, preceded the modern inventions that we have. A lot yeah. of the things that we're using today are, are descendants very similar, of, descendants of what they had back then, yeah. You know, one of the big uses of rubber we see today is tires. So when did that start? Good question. If you, if, you, if you look at history, you're going to probably see that tires were uh, invented as bicycle tires by a uh, veterinarian uh, by the name of John Dunlop in 1888 okay. for his son's bicycle. And of course, with the automobile coming along shortly after that, the establishment of rubber companies like the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in 1898, the tire industry, rubber just took off totally with the tire industry. But it's kind of interesting to note that that, that before that history, back in, in the times we're talking about, in 1847, a, uh, 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 Robert Thompson in, in Scotland had actually constructed a rubber bladdered tire with leather covering and, and they rode it on carriages for 2,500 miles and it, it achieved write-ups in Scientific American and everything, but people wow. were not ready to ride on air, so they kind of disappeared for half a century. Oh, wow, so, you know, not everything with all of the innovations that came along with rubber were widely accepted not right away. right away, no, no. Kind of took all. them some time. It did, it did in, in some cases, yes. Well, thanks Mike for being here You're and welcome. sharing your collection with us. And thank you for watching here at the Civil War Digital Digest. We'll see you in a couple weeks.